observed, and yet there's two of them where the limit does not agree, and then that will not have a limit either. Well, that's all fine and dandy. I see this in one calculus book after another. But what they don't tell you is that the converse is also true. This is the only way a function can fail to have a limit at a point in two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space. Um, I don't know why. I mean, there's been a theorem uh, back in 1932 already. Somebody knows that this, the converse of this theorem holds as well. If, if you've got uh, if either of these things happen, you've got a limit. By the way, the way limit is defined in, when you're talking from two-dimensional space to three-dimensional space, it doesn't talk about approaching a point along curves. It's, it's a more complicated concept, and I don't want to get into it right now. But, but this, this theorem will tell you, you can just think about what's going along on smooth curves. Okay, what is a smooth curve? A smooth curve is a range of a C infinity. C infinity just says you can take as many derivatives as you want. You've got a function, C, going from the real line into Rn. Think of a plane or, or three-dimensional space. Whose derivative is never the zero vector. When you're up in two-dimensional or three-dimensional spaces, vectors suddenly become very important. And you, your derivatives will be vectors rather than just ordinary numbers. And here's, here's what's important about this. Because the derivative is never zero, the range has a continuously turning tangent line. In other words, you don't have any corners. Think about, uh, here, here's an example uh, to illustrate what, uh, one way of thinking about smoothness is you're driving along in a car and, and you might be changing direction, you might be turning around corners and everything, but as long as you're moving, you're tracing out a smooth curve. But if you suddenly stop, you can change direction completely, have a, your path will have a corner in it, and, and there's no tangent there. It'll be coming in one way, going out the other way, and nothing, no smooth transition in between. So that's, that's important there. Uh, and, and I can talk, about, I will be talking also about what happens if you've got infinite differentiability, but you do, but you do have a zero vector. But let's um, go on now. Textbook theorem has a strength in converse. The converse, well, I'll tell you what the converse would say just by itself. That was a 1932 theorem that you just had the converse and nothing more. But let's, let's go through this. We've got a function going from uh, n-dimensional space to the reals. If f does not have a limit at p, then either one of two things is going to happen. Either there's a smooth curve through p on which the limit does not exist. Okay, um, that's, that's straight from the theorem, except now it's the conclusion uh, rather than the hypothesis. It goes with the then rather than the if. Or, there are two straight lines through P on which the limit exists. Limits exist but are unequal. You don't have to look at all the smooth curves that this alternative. Uh, the, the straightforward converse would say there are two uh, smooth curves through P on which the limits exist but are unequal. But you can confine yourself with two straight lines and that will do it. And not only if, if this happens, then um, you don't have to, you might not have to hunt very long for two straight lines because there's infinitely many other straight lines where you get this agreement. So if one fails and one of them are two of the this is all two straight lines. And every real number between R1 and R2 is a limit along some straight line through P. So it fails very badly. You get a very bad failure of agreement. So that's the theorem. And so let me give you some idea of how this, the proof of this theorem goes. Uh, oh, before I do that, let me show you uh, some ways in which, well, one way in which uh, that second thing could happen, that second possibility. Um, look at 
just your ordinary, look at the planet Earth. You've got these degrees of latitude here. You've got, we've we'll all talked about longitude. Uh, every point on the Earth has a certain latitude. Over at the equator, you've got a latitude of zero. At the poles, you've got a latitude of 90. Now, uh, we'll, we'll do one little thing, though. Uh, we won't distinguish between north and south. This would be 15 south latitude. This is 15 north latitude. We just label them with the same number, 15. Okay, now imagine yourself tunneling through the earth, straight <coughs> towards the center. And all the time, you're, you've got a uh, sign on your back saying 15 here. And as you approach the center, you're still saying 15. And you go all the way through, still saying 15. And somebody else comes out, starts tunneling at 60, goes straight through, always saying 60. Well, these. As, as you go along these straight lines, you've got a continuous function. Each person has a continuous function because it doesn't change at all. It's the same constant function. But if you start tunneling here, you start tunneling here, you're going to get disagreement. And that's how uh, that second thing can happen. But on the other hand, you, you really do need that second thing because um, when you go to look at smooth curves through, uh, they'll do the same thing as if you were going through straight lines. They'll be approaching limits all the time. And, and uh, the, how do you figure out that if you use a smooth curve, which is definitely not a straight line, uh, you're going in towards the center. You've always got a tangent. A tangent over here might be like this, and then further on out, it might be tilted like that. And, and, but as, as you go in, as you're approaching the very center, if the curve is smooth, there won't be a corner there, so you'll be coming in tangent to some straight line there. And as you do that, the limit you're approaching along the smooth curve is exactly the same as the limit you're approaching along the straight line. So, uh, the discontinuity will not show up just by following one smooth curve. You've got to take two smooth curves, and in fact, two straight lines are enough. You've got to search for disagreement rather than just going along one curve and seeing that it's discontinuous that way. Um, yeah, before explaining this slide, I want to mentioned that also the textbooks will tell you the opposite. I mean, the, the way the opposite thing can fail is uh, you could have limits along the, all the straight lines of green, but if you approach along, well, let's, let's look at another that picture again. They've got examples that have got this textbook where you've got these functions that are defined all over the disk, and as you approach the origin along any straight line, you'll always get the same answer. But if you approach along the parabola, you get a different answer. And so, uh, and in fact, the limit won't exist along the parabola. That's, that's another interesting thing. But, yeah, now let's, let's go on and talk about how do we decide, how, how was I able to prove that there? Um, okay. We have to uh, start talking. First, I have to give you a sort of a, a warm up here. Talking about, we've got a sequence of points converging to a point, like over here. Here's one point, here's another point, here's another point. These points are converging into a point P. Okay? A sub n is a distance from P sub n to P. So here's P sub n. Here's the distance to P. While B sub n is the distance from P sub n to R, if, if you've got a situation, well, here's, here's a, I'm defining something here. I'm defining a concept. We'll say that P sub n is tangential to R. If P sub n is not equal to P for all that, we're just approaching P. But the limit of this ratio, B sub n to A sub n, you're looking at the height of this, 
triangle versus the hypotenuse. If that limit approaches zero, that's what it means for the sequence of points to be tangential to the real line. So instead of uh, talking about curves being tangential to some line, we're now talking about sequences of points being tangential to a line. So just a generalization of the idea of what it means for a curve to be tangential to a line. Okay. Um, yeah, the definition allows you to be the piece of that to be on R itself. You just go along the line and then of course the line is tangential to the sequence. Okay, now here's an important lemma. It says that if you've got a point in Rm and a piece of it approaches P, then there's a ray R starting at P and a subsequence of Pm that is tangential to R. In other words, you might have these points coming in all kinds of different directions and approaching P, but you can always take an infinite subsequence that is going rather regularly and tangential to some line. And so, um, yeah, the proof, uh, unfortunately, a proof involves some rather advanced calculus concepts. It involves the concept of compactness, and there's a famous theorem called the bolzano larstrass theorem that says that if you have an infinite sequence of points on a compact surface then, or, or, or any, any compact object, then there will be what's called an accumulation point. There will be a point so that no matter how close you get to the point, there will be infinitely many points in the sequence that are closer to the point than you are. That's, that's, that's what an accumulation point is. And that's the key to proving this lemma. So, first of all, we'll take a simple case where P is the origin. We can always translate things to the origin if that's not true. This represents the, uh, the unit sphere. Like, for instance, in, in R2, we talk about the unit circle. In R3, it's the unit sphere. And we're taking all these, uh, any point in R, except for the origin, any point in my two-dimensional space, uh, you can project it to a point on the, two, on the unit circle, three-dimensional space, every point except the origin projects to a unique point on the unit sphere, and so on. So without loss of generality, we can assume the piece of end of our index in one to one fashion, uh, so that no two are on the same ray. If they're all, if, because if, if the infinitely many were on the same ray, it would be done. That would be the uh, the, the subsequence that's tangential to the ray because it's actually on the ray. So now you just, just argue a little bit and you see that uh, you can take another subsequence which is really no two are on the same ray. Okay. Now that a sub, and I take a subsequence of that, this projection converges to a point uh, Q on the unit's Sphere. The unit sphere or unit um, circle is compact. So you've actually got the projections. You can take a subsequence that converges to a point on that sphere. And you let R be the ray from the origin to the point that you're approaching. And then this piece of N sub I is a little bit tangential to R. And why is that? Because, well, let's go back to the other slide here. You have, um, here, think of it this way. Here's the, here's the unit circle. We're talking in R2. Here's the unit circle. These two projections, you've got the two coming in towards the origin, but uh, they, they project onto the unit circle. And the projections come down like this towards Q. Here's Q. And now, um, because they're converging down to here, the angles that they're making are going to zero. And the ratio of A sub n to A sub n also goes to zero because of the angle going to zero. 
See, these points, they could be approached to peak very rapidly, but as long as the projections are converging down like this, the ratios, uh, this vertical line is shrinking a lot faster than this uh, hypotenuse. All right, so that's, that's why you get tangential to R. Now we have a theorem that you can run a smooth curve through a sequence of points. Let O be the origin of an RM. If P sub n is tangential to a ray R at zero, then there is a C infinity of infinitely differentiable function from reals to your either the plane or three-dimensional space with no more zero derivative, in other words, a smooth curve. And the range of the smooth curve passes through infinitely many of the points P sub n. Okay, that's the, that's the key. Once lemma 2 is proved, we can prove theorem 2 also. We assume again without loss of generality, P is the origin of O. Suppose first that F is unbounded in every neighborhood of zero. Well, then there's a sequence approaching zero so that the function is unbounded, and the monotone is unbounded, and then you take this H here, and its range is a smooth curve to zero, which this is alternative one. In other words, along that curve, you'll be approaching infinity. It will be increasing without a bound. On the other hand, if the function is bounded in some neighborhood of zero, then you get sequences converging to p, so that f of p and f of q n converge to different numbers, r1 and r2. And then by lemma one, you get these rays that are ten that these two sequences are tangential to, and you let you get a line through P extending each of these rays. And if F, uh, if you just look at what the F does on that line, if it doesn't have a limit of P, then we have alternative one, of course. If it has a limit xi for both i, but ri not equal xi for some i then you connect the range of H through P with the ray opposite Ri. That will give you a smooth curve um, that will still, you're going to lose continuity there. Otherwise, um, what will happen is that these two lines will get perfect smoothness. I mean, you'll be approaching the limit there, you'll be approaching the limit there, but the limit's won't. So that there's, there's these two lemmas again. If you have um, these convert, a sequence converting to P, you get a ray starting at P, subsequence of P, so you have this tangential to R. Uh, if you have, uh, then, then if you've got that subsequence tangential there, then you can run a smooth curve through it. Well, Where the limit does not exist, then there's a curve 
to root p, which is the range of a C infinity function such as the limit of f does not exist on C. <coughs> Notice what's missing. What's missing is smoothness. This thing can have a corner, and that's what makes it possible to say that the limit does not exist. You take two straight lines on which the limit exist, does not exist, and, and um, but they have different, uh, excuse me, two straight lines where you, you, you're always, as long as you're on one line, the limit exists, as long as you're on the other line, the limit exists, but they don't agree. Well, what you can do is make a curve with a corner in it. You go along one line for a while until you come to the intersection, and then you go along the other line, and you've got a discontinuity there. But that corner, you can only, you cannot get it with a smooth function, but you can certainly get it with an infinitely differentiable function. Think about going along one of the lines and slowing down, slowing down to a stop when you come to the intersection, and then speeding up again along the other line. That's a differentiable function, no discontinuity. Well, you, when you're tracing this thing, you don't get a discontinuity, so you've got a nice little infinitely differentiable curve function, but um, when you look at what's going on there, uh, the numbers will get a discontinuity by the corner of it to the two lines per set. On the other hand, uh, yeah, so, so this works out nicely, but when you're in infinite dimensional space, if you don't, if you have a, a function which and there exists a continuous function from every all, the whole infinite dimensional space to the real line except for the one point on the origin and it doesn't approach it the limit at zero and then it approaches zero the same number through every smooth curve through zero so the strength and converse that i told you about no longer holds an infinite in any dimension okay well that's it, except for acknowledgments. I'm, I'm indebted to Adam Dow, who's at the UNC Charlotte, he's in the math department there. He gave me a short proof of level one. I had a longer, more complicated proof. Thanks go to my daughter, Sarah, for making this PowerPoint presentation for me. I'm not computer savvy enough to do some of the stuff that she did, drawing the, getting those diagrams to behave the way they should. And finally, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for this opportunity to express these results. Do you have any questions? Yes, I would to ask the presentation. Yes, about the example when, when X is in is that proof constructive or just an yeah, well, it's, it's an existence proof. Well, it uses the axiom of choice. You use a homo basis and you work with the homo basis and then you construct it that way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, by the way, my daughter couldn't resist putting an extra slide in there. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Magnus.